Hey, y'all. Recently, I requested to receive listener stories to share on the podcast, and y'all really delivered. So much so that I have enough stories to fill two episodes. There's a nice variety of hauntings, unexplained creatures, and cryptids here, so I hope y'all enjoy. Now, please be aware, while I usually keep the language clean for the episodes, I have left all foul language intact to maintain the integrity of the listener experiences. I'm Candace, and I'll be your guide. Our first story from today is from B. Hi, I recently found your podcast and I love it. You can call me B. I don't think you asked for a specific theme, so I picked an experience I had in a house I'm convinced is haunted. Okay, the story takes place in my cousin's house. This was the first time I'd spent the night there, and I was maybe 15 or 16. I was there to help my cousin out with her kid's birthday sleepover, who had just turned six. As soon as I stepped into their home, something felt weird. Not exactly evil or even angry, but very stressful. I got there a bit before the rest of the guests, so I figured I was just nervous about the looming horde of excited girls. I set down the birthday gifts and walked into the kitchen to see how I could help. I'm going to take a second to describe the layout of the house. It's necessary. The three bedrooms are all grouped in a line on the left along with the bathroom then the dining room, and the living room, which is one giant room only separated by an archway down the middle, and the living room was one step lower. Finally, on the right was the kitchen, which was a square room and quite small. It had a big island that barely left enough room to walk around it, and on the far wall, a back door that had some pretty steep, narrow steps leading down to it. Fortunately, my cousin had most of it under control, so I just had to make sure the living room was sleepover ready. I made sure all of the sleeping bags and blankets were spread out and that the TV was set up with the movie. I set mine closest to the kitchen doorway, but facing the opposite wall. I still couldn't shake off this stressed feeling. It was like I was supposed to be somewhere, stopping something bad from happening. I also kept almost falling, sometimes over nothing. I'm not usually so clumsy, but it was so bad my cousin got worried and told me to just sit down before I hurt myself. I listened to her advice and sat watching the kids for the rest of the night. The girls decided they would stay up all night, something they'd never done before. Everyone was so hyped and prepared to play all night, but fortunately, fate had other plans and everyone was pleasantly dreaming by 1 a.m. I usually fall asleep easily. My head hits the pillow and I'm gone. I have been the victim of many sleepover shenanigans because I'd be the first to sleep. That night was different, however. I just couldn't sleep that night. It didn't matter how tired I was. I'd recently heard of astral projecting, which is a way to have an out-of-body experience. I decided I'd try it that night since I couldn't sleep anyway. There are several methods, but the one I'd seen involved emptying your mind before setting the intention to project and repeating that process until you fell asleep. The first few times were uneventful. However, after that, I kept having this, I don't know what it was exactly. The closest I can find is an intrusive thought, but that's not exactly right. I was standing in the corner of their kitchen. It looked like a party was going on, red solo cups and everything. I was watching this man in a blue shirt and cargo shorts with his back to me, and drunk. He was the only one in the kitchen and was just dancing, and he danced onto the back door steps and slipped. He hit his head on the corner of the island on his way down and landed on the floor hard. I won't go into all the gory details, but there was a lot of blood, and it was obvious he was dead. That kept looping over and over every time I closed my eyes, I couldn't get it to stop. I sat up and shook my head until I was dizzy, thinking maybe if I distracted myself, it'd go away. No such luck. I suddenly thought maybe that it was a spirit trying to show me something. Both my mom and I have had some pretty weird things happen like that before. I was taught that you were supposed to ignore them and not speak to them directly. However, I was desperate, 
so I mentally screamed at it that it wasn't welcome here and to leave me alone. That finally got it to stop, but now I'm silently freaking out because I just did exactly what not to do. I sat there, my adrenaline wearing off, waiting for what might happen next. Nothing happened. Everything was silent except for the occasional car and everyone's breathing. That stressed out feeling I'd gotten used to had also left. Eventually, after what felt like hours, I finally drifted off. I woke up with a strange feeling I had a nightmare, but couldn't remember what I dreamt. Everyone else was already up and had eaten, so I went to fix myself something. When I sat down with my cereal, my cousin sat down with me. She asked if I'd heard anything weird last night, and I said no, and she went on to explain that she'd woken up around 4 a.m. because of a giant crash in the kitchen. She rushed out, thinking one of the kids had woken up early and hurt themselves trying to get something to eat. Well, not only was there no crying girl, everyone was asleep. Even I was. After checking that everything was okay, she went back to sleep. I didn't tell her about my experience. She seemed freaked out enough without it. The rest of the day was uneventful, and when all of the girls had been picked up by their parents, I just went back home. Needless to say, I obviously didn't go back to that house, and they ended up getting to move into a bigger place just a few weeks later. Our next story is from Father J.P. My name is J.P., I'm 38, and I was born and raised in West Virginia. I went away for seminary for a few years and came back and now serve the people of West Virginia as a priest. One day I'm outside praying my rosary, and I hear from the woods what sounds like several voices singing. I stop, and the hair on the back of my neck stands up. It's beautiful singing, and in a language I have never heard before. It seemed like it was getting closer. I knock on the window for my secretary to come out. She steps out, and she heard it too. However, when she came out, it started getting quieter and quieter. I remembered something my great-grandmother, who was a granny witch, told me when I was small. Never go towards the singing or anyone or anything calling my name in the woods. I've seen and heard a lot of paranormal things due to the nature of my ministry, but this was by far one of the most bizarre things. I will never forget it. Thank you for sharing my story. This next story is from Kara. Hello, my name is Kara, and I was born and raised in East Tennessee. My granny was a caterer, and she was raised in the borderlands between East Tennessee and East Kentucky. I spent my early springs decorating graves on Memorial Day and tearing through the woods in Jellicoe. I have always been drawn to the supernatural and the paranormal, and there have been numerous and unexplained happenings that seem to indicate the spiritual and paranormal are drawn to me as well. This story is about one of those ghostly experiences. Even though I have lived in East Tennessee my entire life, I had never heard of a little place about an hour from where I live called Rugby until about 10 years ago, when I was accepted to attend a small writer's retreat there. If you aren't aware of this town, you can type Rugby Tennessee into a search engine and learn all about it. It's a community that boasts lodging, hiking, food, and a little cluster of Victorian buildings which have been there since the 1880s, when Thomas Hughes tried to found a utopian society. And if you type in Rugby Tennessee Hauntings, you can learn even more. I don't want to provide too many spoilers, so I'll leave you to do your own searching. I will, however, let you know that some of us were staying in the Newberry House. The Newberry House is considered one of the most haunted buildings in town. Luckily, I wasn't staying in the most haunted room, I was just staying next to it. The Newberry House still maintains a lot of its Victorian-style integrity, and I adored it from the moment I stepped inside. I had already read about the hauntings, but to me, it seemed peaceful and comforting. The first night, all of us met in the living room of the Newberry House to do a writing exercise. We spoke a lot about place that night, and after everyone had written and read, the subject came around to the place we were staying, rugby. Our hostess, who is both an Appalachian writer and a beautiful soul, said that she felt there were places in the world where the veil between the spiritual world and the physical world was thinner. She said she believed that rugby was most definitely a thin place. 
Well, having read all of Rugby's haunting information beforehand like the self-proclaimed geek-out girl I was, I had to chime in at this point and relay a little history. I told our group that Newberry House was considered one of the most haunted houses in Rugby and proceeded to explain why. Several people thought the history was very interesting. One person in our group staying in the haunted room wasn't as intrigued as the rest of us, understandably so. As I said earlier, I felt perfectly at home in the Newberry house and in the room upstairs where I stayed. That didn't keep me from being anxious when I went to sleep that night. I decided to use a calming noise app to help me drift off to sleep. For you youngins out there, this was an era before you needed adapters to plug your earbuds into your cell phone. This was also a time before I could afford wireless earbuds. Because I had wires to deal with, my setup was slightly annoying. I had to sleep with my earbuds in my ears and a cord attached to my phone. I would have made it work, except the earbuds or my app or both just kept quitting on me all night. Of course, I chalked it up to shoddy reception since at that time the wireless wasn't strong in rugby. The shoddy reception coupled with my active imagination kept me from fully entering deep sleep for quite a while. Oh, and I kept my bedroom light on. You know, just in case. I would close my eyes, start to doze, and inevitably the app would stop for some unknown reason. I'd shake myself awake, fiddle with my phone until the app started working again, and then attempt to fall back asleep. This continued until about 3 a.m. So far, nothing had happened that couldn't be logically explained, but what happened next still can't be explained away. Suddenly, for no reason at all, the fire alarm above the door in my room started to scream in a loud, ear-piercing wail, and it kept blaring. I sat up, more annoyed than shocked, and looked around the room. No fire, no smell of smoke, nothing. I made a flimsy attempt to move some of the Victorian furniture over to the doorway and stand on it to get to the fire alarm. FYI, Victorian cushions are wobbly. When I couldn't reach it the first time, I made up my mind to wait until someone else woke up because at this point, I was possibly the only one hearing this. I thought I might be going crazy. I opened my door, looked across and down the carpeted hallway, and waited. For a few moments, no one opened their doors or emerged from their rooms. I felt I couldn't possibly hold the scream inside my chest any longer. My writer friends slowly and groggily opened their doors, rubbing their eyes and looking confused. One man approached my room and asked me what happened. Matter-of-factly, I said, My fire alarm went off for no reason. I can't get to it. Luckily, he was less in shock and therefore more able to balance on Victorian furniture than I was. He pulled a footrest over, stood up, and turned it off. After the blaring siren stopped, I explained again that my fire alarm just went off for no apparent reason. We all looked around my room and smelled for smoke. Nothing. We were all too tired to investigate further. After we were sure everyone was safe, we ambled back to their rooms. Honestly, I can't remember if I even got to sleep that night or not. The next morning, we woke up and found the most haunted room had been abandoned. The writer staying in that room was gone. At first, we thought he'd just gotten up early and gone for a walk in the woods that surround Rugby. But he wasn't at breakfast. Then we went for a small hike and talked more about the sense of place. When we came back, he wasn't at lunch. Finally, sometime after lunch, our hostess received a text from him stating he had a family emergency and had to return to Ohio. We finally decided to do some Scooby-Doo-like detective work. Remember, this is a Victorian house. The doorknobs are still old-fashioned, and his empty room was still unlocked. We tiptoed in and looked around. There was a glass turned over. There was also an old picture face down on the dresser. We figured that the glass had been turned over accidentally. The turned over picture, however, was an old Victorian picture of Charles Oldfield. You should definitely do a search about him. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, we never figured out a logical reason for the smoke detector going off during the witching hour. Fortunately, we started a group on social media and all remained friends. Our writer friend Earl, the one who shushed the fire alarm for me, will tell you he can't explain it, but it was most likely a fluke. Our other writer friend who stayed in the haunted room and left abruptly still won't explain anything. Since he's a writer, he concocted a great tall tale about what happened that night, posting it sentence by sentence in our group. 
But as for the real story, I guess we'll never know. Love to Appalachia and all of my creatives in the world. Thanks for reading my ghostly tale. This next story comes to us from Sherry Perry. Hello, I am the founder of Appalachian Spirits, Haunting, and Folklore on Facebook, and this is one of my stories. Years ago, when I was an LPN, I worked in a nursing home in Milton, West Virginia. It was a beautiful historic building that used to be a polio hospital. Every evening, when it came near time to do dressing changes, my aide would watch for me to come down the hall because I needed help with this one particular patient. At the time, we still wore white uniforms, and I had a squeaky shoe. My aide was in a room giving care, and she said she heard my squeaky shoe coming down the hall, and she glanced out the door and caught a glimpse of my blonde hair and white uniform. She quickly finished up what she was doing and went to the patient's room. I was not there, and there were no exits that didn't have alarms. She went to the nurse's station, and I was in there working. She asked me how did I get back up there without her seeing me. I told her that I had not been down there yet and had not left the station. The following three stories were submitted by Christopher Burns. This is part one, my encounter with the little men. This story is one of my first memories. It takes place either shortly before or shortly after my third birthday. It would be the last week in June, 1980. My mom and I went to West Virginia to celebrate my birthday with her side of the family. We were living in Aberdeen, Maryland at the time, so it wasn't too long of a trip. My mom's family lives about 10 miles away from the small town of Shady Spring in Raleigh County on Irish Mountain Road. One day, my cousin Leonard decided he would take me back into the woods. I remember he had a rifle on his back, so I'm assuming he was hunting something, raccoon or squirrels most likely. I still don't understand why my mom or the rest of the family allowed Leonard to take a three-year-old into the woods. Different era, I guess. So Leonard took me into the woods and we walked around for a while. I remember being in awe of how massive it all seemed. Then again, everything seems larger to a three-year-old. I don't know how long we walked, but I became tired or a nuisance. My cousin Leonard decided to leave me sitting on a log while he continued wandering the woods. I know. I know, you're going to leave a three-year-old alone in the woods where there are bears and poisonous snakes. While I sat there, I was starting to become afraid of the animal noises that were coming from deeper in the woods and that seemed to be getting closer. I had no idea how to get back to my grandparents' house. I was just about to start crying when I looked over at a tree that was about 30 feet away. At the foot of the tree were some little men. I'm not talking dwarf small, more like the size of a squirrel. These little men were sitting around the base of the tree and were smoking pipes. They wore red hats and had beards. They were looking right at me. They must have realized I was frightened over the whole experience. They smiled and all pointed in one direction. I don't know why, but I decided to follow the direction they were pointing. It felt as if I was walking a very long time, but eventually I returned to my grandparents' house. I started yelling for my mom. She came outside and was shocked to see that I'd come home without my cousin. She asked me where he was, and I told her that he'd left me alone in the woods. Needless to say, he got an earful from my mom, our grandparents, and his mother. It wasn't until years later that I told my mom about the little men who'd pointed my way out of the woods. Years later, when researching fairies, that I discovered I was helped by gnomes or some species in the gnome family. Part 2. Possible Crawler Experience In 1990, my mom, little sister, and I went back to pay the family a visit for the summer. I decided to go for a long hike alone in those same woods. When I'd gone pretty far and the canopy was pretty thick overhead that it was blocking out most of the sunlight, I started to feel as though I was being watched. I'm a huge horror fan, and I know that you should trust your instincts when you get that feeling. But being young and thinking I was invincible, as youth generally does, I continued hiking. I kept taking glances back behind me when I noticed something was looking at me from beside a tree. It quickly moved towards the tree and blended in. I can't describe the creature any other way, 
then it's as if part of the tree came alive and separated from the tree itself. It never attempted to cause me any harm, and I saw it several more times during that summer. It just seemed to be observing me. It frightened me, though, so I never hiked alone in those woods again after that initial sighting, and I didn't point it out to my cousins and sister on subsequent hikes. Something told me it should just be ignored. Part 3 My Alien Encounter, Aberdeen, Maryland Somewhere between June 27, 1980 and April 23, 1981, we were living in Aberdeen, Maryland on a military base. The house was a two-story brick townhome, and all the houses on the base looked the same. I had a large bedroom and a king-size bed all to myself. On this night, I was sleeping. At that time, I slept with the light on, but dimmed because I was afraid of the dark. I woke up in the middle of the night and had an urge to play my kid-sized electric piano. I crawled out of bed and walked quietly to the piano across the room. I turned it on and sat back down on the bed while it warmed up. When I was certain that it was ready, I walked back to the piano and pushed the two lowest keys. The notes let out this low, depressing moan. I held the keys down for a while, not sure how long. When I let go of the keys, I turned around and looked at my closet. Standing there in my closet and reaching out for me were four beings. They had pale, slightly grayish skin. They had large black eyes, two slits made up their nose, non-existent ears, and small mouths. They were all reaching out to me with their four-digited hands. They wore black jumpsuits. On the front of the jumpsuits was a metallic silver triangle logo, and emblazoned across the triangle was a blue metallic lightning bolt. They didn't move towards me. They just stood there at the door of the closet, reaching towards me. I ran towards the bed, hid my head under the covers, and began to scream. Instantly, my mom and dad were there asking what was going on. I explained to them that the cone heads were coming after me. I'm sure I'd seen the Coneheads on Saturday Night Live at some time, and they were the only thing that I remotely related to what I'd seen, even though they were nowhere close. I had told them that I played my piano, and the Coneheads were reaching for me. Mom stayed at the bed to comfort me while Dad walked over to the piano and pushed a key. Sure enough, the piano was on. As the key made the note, I told Dad to stop, or they'll come back. I don't know if I went and slept with my parents that night or if I managed to just fall back to sleep after they spent some time with me, assuring me that the coneheads weren't in the closet. The next morning, my dad took my piano outside and smashed it with a sledgehammer. In hindsight, I find that to be a rather odd reaction. It wasn't until years later when I was in junior high that I was watching Unsolved Mysteries, that I happened to see illustrations of what had appeared in my closet. These illustrations were from people who were abducted by aliens. My mom and sister were asleep when I was watching this show. My dad was deployed to Kuwait for the Persian Gulf War. Upon seeing the images, I dropped to my knees and began shaking and crying. The images were exactly what I'd seen, except most of the images of the greys didn't have clothes on. Until finally, there was one image, a drawing of a grey wearing a black jumpsuit, and on the jumpsuit was a triangle insignia. No lightning bolt, though. From time to time, I mentioned that night to my parents, and they have absolutely no recollection of me screaming my head off and talking about cone heads. They do remember the destruction of my piano, though. This final story was submitted by Earl, who was a witness to his friend John's cryptid encounter. I was fishing with a good friend in the fall of 2007 outside Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania, White Bridge Road area in a small trout stream after a fall stocking. My friend, who I will call John and I, hunted and fished together for years, and I'd grown up on a farm in that area and knew the wildlife well. We were not drinking or using any controlled substances. I was fishing downstream. John was 10 to 12 feet behind me. He was fishing along the bank, working trout held up under the bank. The stream is 5 to 9 feet wide, 2 to 3 feet deep. 
The area we were in had high banks to the left and right. A small trail was on my left. On my right, heavy woods and underbrush. It was about five to six in the evening, and we were getting ready to go get dinner. A rock landed on the bank to my left. I turned to John and told him to stop throwing rocks or he would spook the trout. He said he did not throw it. About that time, I smelled something very bad. It got very quiet. No birds, no deer, no sound. It stayed like that for five to eight minutes. Very unsettling, and I've never experienced it before or after. I again want to state John and I both grew up in the country, and it was a new experience for us. The silence was broken by a splash and John screaming. He had been hit with a rock in the head. He dropped his tackle and everything and just climbed up the bank. John is not a fit man and enjoys a bait good whenever he can, so I found that shocking. He ran the mile or so to my truck. I reeled in my line, collected as much of John's stuff as I could, and started heading out. I was unaware of what he had seen and was not scared, but rather concerned for his well-being, not knowing what happened. The smell was still very present, as was the eerie feeling. I found John in the cab of my truck crying with the doors locked. After he let me come in, all he said was, I fucking saw it and it's real. It's fucking real. I asked what he meant and he was silent and spaced out. I hardly ever heard him swear, much less the F word. I only included it to stay true to the events. John wanted to skip dinner and go home, something unusual for him. His life changed. He sold me all his hunting and fishing equipment for a low price. I keep telling him he can have it back any time. He says he will not go into the woods again. He will not visit me on my farm in the country, nor will he go to his family's camp in the National Forest. He claims he saw a Bigfoot. Seven feet four inches based on where he later told me its head was in relation to a tree. I messaged on another trip to try to find a simple explanation to help his mental state. I've been unsuccessful. Some notable information. A Pennsylvania Bigfoot group had a report of one crossing the road about 20 minutes before our event in the area and at a distance easy to travel in that time. They are unwilling to share more information with me. It was about 50 to 55 degrees, winds light, Sun was not in a location to produce unclear shadows in the area as I've gone back many times looking for answers. I've never reported this before and will answer any questions you have. Thanks. I asked Earl a few follow-up questions to clarify the events. I asked what the Bigfoot did, if anything, if they heard any tree knocking sounds, just how big this rock was, and if John has experienced anything subsequently. The following is his reply. I just called him and it's the same as the day it happened. He claims that it stood there and made uncomfortable eye contact with him for a few seconds before he decided to run. He doesn't even remember running, only sitting in my truck. The impression he got from it was, you don't belong here, get out. He had trouble sleeping for a while after. I did feel that uneasy feeling of being watched. The silence is what sticks with me. I've never experienced it before or since. When I bought my farm, I invited John and his family out to visit, and he declined because it was too far in the country. We'd fished that area many times before with nothing of note happening. He did start going to church after being non-religious about two to three weeks after the incident until present, and does still have the odd nightmare or two. I don't recall any wood knocking. That's not to say it didn't happen. The trout were biting, and I was pretty tuned into the fish. To be honest, if I did hear wood breaking or something, my thought would have been it's just a deer running or a bear doing bear stuff, and just wrote it off. I would say the rock was baseball to softball sized. The one that hit him did leave a nice bruise and break the skin a little, but not bad enough to require care. They were pretty average of the rocks around the area. I only saw the one that hit the bank and really had no idea what was going on or that I should take note.
Okay, that wraps up our Listener Submissions Volume 1. Now let's talk about it. I'm just going to go story by story here with a few quick thoughts on each. We'll start with B and the astral projection experience. Honestly, had it not been for my own unexplainable experience in this realm, which you can check out my own Paranormal Stories episode if you're not sure what I'm talking about, I probably wouldn't entirely believe that these type of experiences held any water. But having had my own, I can't discount any of the strange happenings that others experience when reaching or trying to reach the astral realm. It sounds like maybe B did manage to see into another timeline of past events. I'm curious about the history of the house, of course, and if there's any way that could be explored, but it's always just so difficult. I'm sure that was also a really difficult thing for her to have to witness, especially over and over. JP, the priest who heard the singing from the woods, that is a beautiful story. We don't hear a lot of paranormal stories that are ethereal and really special without that fearful element. Of course, I'm curious what the language they were using would be or could be, but I am really happy you got to have that experience. Kara's story at the Newberry House really provides a perfect setting for the story. I would say the fire alarm on its own was a fluke or an electrical short, but the difficulties playing the noise app does add credibility to it potentially being more. Of course, it could also just be bad Wi-Fi and a fluke. It's really a case where we don't know that this was paranormal, but the setting was nice and spooky, and I'm sure it really contributed whether it was or wasn't. It sounds like an awesome place to check out and a really cool experience, though. Sherry, the nurse at the hospital. This is a good one. Doppelgangers are one of the scarier manifestations for me. It begs the question, are doppelgangers entities that mirror our appearance perfectly, or is it maybe just a glimpse into another timeline? For Christopher and his three stories, the one about the gnomes is a fun departure. There aren't a ton of modern day experiences with more mythic creatures, so it's a delightful departure from my usual content. Personally, I'm more inclined to believe that this could have been some sort of guardian entity manifesting itself in a kid-friendly way, if that makes sense. Something trying to guide you and help you out, but not scare you. But also, I'm not really one to believe in the more folkloric, mythic creatures personally. For those who do, it does indeed sound pretty gnomish. It's a shame in a sense the crawler-type entity kept camouflaging itself with the tree, but I feel like you're right not to engage with something actively trying to keep itself concealed. But maybe if you had, it would have just scurried off. Who knows, really? The aliens in the closet is so intriguing. Of course, the skeptic's answer would be that it was a nightmare, but outside of that, it's really eerie how it seems as if the piano tones summoned something. While I do believe in extraterrestrials, of course, it makes me wonder, could they just materialize in the closet? Maybe they walked through the wall of the house and were waiting there? I have way more questions than ideas on this one. Overall, your stories are so reflective of how children are so much more perceptive of the supernatural than adults. Whether that's simply a mind more open to magical thinking or more a matter of paranormal sensitivity. Either way, I saved my favorite of this episode for last with Earl's story with his friend John. From personal information in the emails I can't share, I can assure you these are two down-to-earth, logical people. Not to imply in any way that the other listener stories aren't, I just want to stress that this experience was entirely unanticipated. This encounter left John a very changed man. So while Earl didn't see the Bigfoot himself, he was a witness to a reasonable friend's utter panic and total change in mindset after the fact. It is so unfortunate that it seems John can't enjoy the outdoors in the capacity he did before this encounter. It was great having a cryptid story to throw into the mix since they're less common than the average haunting, you could say. But I do hope the story has a different end for John's life than where it is now. Now, I'm sure it's wonderful and my focus is misplaced here, but I would tell John life is too short not to do the things he loves out of fear. One common theme with the stories I've received is the fear that people would think they're crazy if they share their stories. 
you're not crazy. So many of us have had these unexplainable experiences. I'm so grateful to all of you who trusted me to share your stories with the world. Some of our writers have offered to answer questions for any listeners who would like to ask them more about their experience. To maintain their anonymity, I will take questions, field them to the appropriate people, and if they'd like to respond, I can make a follow-up post or short episode to update with their responses. You'll be able to find a post on the Obscure Appalachia Facebook page and Instagram taking questions, or you're welcome to contact me via email, the website, a comment on Spotify, however you like. Speaking of the website, I've recently updated it to be a little nicer. Now I can take reviews from the majority of y'all who can't type an actual review into your podcast provider, as well as receiving voice messages if any of y'all want to speak rather than type. It's pretty nice. You can find that at ObscureAppalachia.com. As always, thank you for listening. If you enjoy the content and would like to help support the show, there are links for Patreon as well as for one-time donations now on the website. You can look forward to Volume 2 of the listener submissions coming in the next episode, December 12th. Thanks, y'all. Until next time. (laughs) 